hungry for expansive wilderness, wicked adventure, epic fishing. I'm gonna bring this one to the reel. Look no further than Northern Saskatchewan. This beautiful wedge of Canadian wilderness has a multi-species fishery straight from any angler's dream. Arctic grayling, lake trout, walleye, and monstrous northern pike, all amidst the backdrop of the boreal forest. With over 100,000 lakes and rivers across the province, and some of the most incredible fishing I've yet to experience, it's no wonder I couldn't wait to return and have the chance to revisit Cree River Lodge. On this trip, I'm joined by one of my best fishing friends, Alex Parks. I couldn't wait to share with her all the wonders of Northern Saskatchewan. Hi everyone, it's Colin McEwen. Welcome to the show tonight. We're gonna to be talking about a lot of great things and one of my favorite species, Northern Pike. Uh, we're going to be focusing on northern Saskatchewan and specifically we're going to be talking about Cree River Lodge, but it's not just about the lodge. We're going to be talking to one of the top pike uh, fly fishers and guides in Saskatchewan, as well as we're going to talk about lines, leader setups, uh, flies, all this great information so that if you've done it, you know, you'll see some of the stuff we're talking about will make sense, but also we'll add some things that you might not know about. And at the same time, for those who haven't fly fished for pike, I think once you watch some of the video we're going to show, you'll understand why we love pike fishing so much. So stay with us. Let's get going here. And what I'm going to do, we just saw a little video clip from Jenna, and we're going to have, uh, I'm going to put up a picture here, and I want you all to have a look at this. And then I'm going to introduce uh, Chip, who has joined us. And just bear with me. I'm really not great with the... Uh, some of the con or the stuff here just hang tight and i'm going to bring in a picture because this picture will tell you everything about uh why i love pike and oh somehow i've lost the picture well i'll bring it back in a second so why don't we just bring in chip right now hey chip uh welcome how you doing there you go hey full screen chip Thanks for joining me tonight, and uh, welcome from Saskatchewan. How are things there? Things are wonderful here, except the water's a little hard for fly fishing, but uh, all good, all good. So what I wanted to put put up was a picture of my daughter with you, and you're holding this giant pike that she caught on a fly. And I was going to talk about the injustice of it all because she's the one who got to go there, and I haven't gone there yet. And I love catching pike. I don't. I don't care if it's Labrador, Northern Ontario, Northern Saskatchewan. But you've got some monster pike there. Holy, we got some monster pike. And even worse about this whole thing is my daughter's got a bigger pike than I've ever caught in my life. That's not right. <laughs> well, there's there's something to be said for for uh, putting the next generation ahead of you and 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 uh, living living vicariously through your kids. But no, we had some we had some pretty fun fishing. It was good. Well, uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, this, uh, I should tell everybody that you're basically the head guide at Cree River Lodge, right? And uh, you've been there for a few years, right? Yeah, I've, I've been working with Pat for seven years now. And before that, I was at another lodge for 33 years. So I, I've, we're, going, we're going on about 40 years of guiding in Saskatchewan now. So. Wow. Okay. So, um, and I should also explain you just don't guide for pike and walleye and grayling and northern Saskatchewan, but you have a passion for fly fishing for pike like I do. Well, it was something that I developed. Uh, my interest in, in fly fishing for pike started probably about my second year of guiding. And uh, some, of the, some of the veteran guides were playing with deer hair mice in some shallow water. And, and the reality was, you know, back in the 80s, there really wasn't much in the way of pike flies. I mean, we were using saltwater streamers and, and the biggest trout flies that we could find and anything that floated. 
And that was really what got me started tying flies was there wasn't anything we had to, we had to tie our own flies or we didn't have them. That's true. And, uh, uh, the smart guys were actually using, uh, uh, patterns from saltwater because they were, they quickly learned that using bunny leeches and some of the other popular patterns that are around in the eighties, uh, nineties, uh, were so heavy to cast and you could blow out your shoulder casting these big flies. And in saltwater, they've got all these great materials that don't hold the water as opposed to a bunny leech. Well, the, the synthetics were definitely an improvement, but, uh, even even when I started, there weren't a lot of, of saltwater flies other than bonefish flies and tarpon flies. Um, the, the the general saltwater fly fishing explosion has kind of paced the, the, the pike world. And, and a lot of that stuff wasn't really, there really wasn't much. I mean, there were, I want to say there were some billfish flies and, and, and oddball stuff, but it was everybody was just kind of getting started that like Larry Dahlberg had put out his video on fly fishing for pike probably a couple of years before that. And, and, but there really, there really wasn't much. And when you're in Saskatchewan, there was even less. I mean, there was no material, no flies, no anything. Well, uh, the good news is for everyone that wants to get into pike fishing, things have changed and it's all very positive from fly lines to wire leaders and of course, fly line design and, and understanding a lot more about how to fly fish for pike and when, right? Hundred percent. I mean, even I, I, I kind of have not really kept track of, of the progress of it, but I know that now it's very easy to find a line, for example, that just you know the, the weight forward, super aggressive line, something like a, a Titan taper or an outbound short something that just pops off the rod. And, you know, when you, when you fly fish for pike, you're, you're stripping that fly all the way to the rod tip. Like there's maybe a foot of line out the end of the rod. We're not quite like the musky guys where we figure eight every time, but we do fish all the way to the boat and, and just try and make sure we take advantage of any fish that comes in. So to be able to get that fly line back out in one or maybe two false casts, you really, it really makes a big difference if you have a very aggressive fly line. I agree. I'm glad you brought that up because here's one right here. Uh, this is uh get the light right there we go uh this is a scientific angler uh, mpx again very aggressive shorter head easy to turn over big flies uh rio makes good lines there's a number of companies but it's so wonderful to see that because not that long ago yeah i use a weight four or nine floating line but it didn't perform with no. a lot of the flies well especially when you got ones that were wind resistant and you you're out there in a gusty day well, and it, it's kind of, uh, in some ways, a little bit counterintuitive. I mean, the flies have also gotten better. We could tie flies with a lot of bulk that have no weight now. And, yeah. and you know, when I first started, uh, used a lot of fur and a lot of things like that, because that's what we had. And and it fur is really not very friendly to a fly rod. It's heavy, it's wet, it stays wet in your fly box. It's, the, the synthetics are so, so much better. Um, my first real fly was probably the Northern Magic. And that one was uh, a synthetic fiber called fish hair, which came from Minneapolis. And one of my guests brought me some, and that's how I got a hold of it to start with, and bucktail. And both of those things shed water really well, cast really well, and and are pretty durable. So that was that was really, for me, where it started. And to be honest, I still use that fly today. Yeah. I'm just going to put up, uh, this is what we're talking about, everyone. This would be uh, a pretty standard fly. I remember when I read Barry Reynolds uh, book about pike fishing, fly fishing, uh, this was one of his favorite patterns, but uh, it gets wet and it's seven inches long. It's like casting a wet sock. And even with a nine weight, that's, that's a chore after a while. Oh, hundred percent. And, and yeah, this, everything about the synthetics is better. The, they, they cast better, they dry out better. Um, they move almost as well. Uh, it's pretty hard to match the actual movement of a bunny fly once it's in the water. But I would say you get 98% of the movement and 10 times better in every other area. Okay. So we'll get back to flies. It's, uh, you know, cause there's so much talk about NCO Pugilese, what he did for the salt water, which came over into the, the freshwater side for pike and musky flies. We'll talk about that, but you know, I think everybody, I know y'all want to see a, 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 some more video and some uh, more information about why I love pike fishing and 
why you know Cree River Lodge is a great place to go. So let's put on a video and then we'll come right back here, Chip. For the first day of our trip exploring northern Saskatchewan, Chip suggested that we take a day trip up the river to an area known as the Dunes. This is one of the most unique geographic features of northern Canada. Massive sand dunes, also known as eskers, stretch for miles across the province, remnants left over from the last ice age. This area of the river by the dunes is known to the guests and guides of Cree River Lodge as one of the main hotspots for massive, hungry northern pike. And this time was no different. Northern pike are what's known as opportunistic hunters. They will often lay in wait for their prey to make a mistake and wander into the kill zone. At this time of year, this typically means anglers need to be searching for patches of weeds adjacent to deep water in order to locate larger fish. Casting into the weeds and stripping your fly over the edge into the deeper water, or even along the edge of weed beds, will set you up for a potential northern pike strike. Luckily for us, the area surrounding the dunes provides a plethora of this deep, weedy structure and Chip knew exactly which weed beds to hit first. Passing. Oh, wow, nice. That was, my fly wasn't on the water for more than Two seconds. I hadn't even had a chance to pull in any of the slack line I had, and it just right there. And we're fishing a weedy point here, um, and it drops off. And because of the heat we've had this summer, the cabbage and the weeds have just really shot up. So I was trying to get it out of the weeds over that drop off, and I didn't even have a chance. Oh man! Thanks, Chip. What? Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Chip. Okay, that was a nice start. Uh, and that wasn't a big pike, I know, by any stretch uh, for Cree River. Um, what, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about, like, it's Cree River, but that's like big water. Can you explain a little bit about where you're at and what the, like what, what can people expect in terms of the fishing and the signs? Well, the Cree River system, as it relates to us, is about 35 miles of river and Wapata Lake, which is about 22, 23 square miles. So we have a lot of fishable water. And the interesting thing about our particular area is that we're actually located in the sand, Athabasca Sand Basin rather than what you would normally consider the shield. So it's very much more organic. Uh, we get very little of that um, clear, you know, sterile water. Everything around us is a little bit more turbid, a lot of weed growth, a lot of organics, and a, just a huge biomass. There's whitefish, there's walleye, there's, there's pike, there's just a ton of, ton of uh, forage fish for them as well. So um, the river kind of defines most of our fishing. Uh, everything is really adjacent to current that we fish. Very, very few uh, of the bays that we fish are like what you would consider a back bay on a lake. And, and there are some, but almost everything is, is relatively close to current. And so that it kind of equalizes the, uh, the temperatures a little bit. Uh, as the summer goes on, we don't get quite the same stratification as a lot of the nor nor other northern lakes where the bays are, you know, well-defined temperature wise. It, it, the water mixes a little bit more. So uh, temperatures stay a little more even for us than, than a lot of lakes. But um, one of the other things about all that organic is, is, is the weed growth is, is tremendous. We have weed, huge weed beds and, and, and our fish 
relate to the weeds probably starting uh, typically third week in June, you're already finding fish in weed beds. And so what that means for us is, is on the nice days when the sun, you know, getting some solar gain in the bays and whatnot, the fish will move in in the afternoons kind of in that typical fashion. But when, when you get weather that's not ideal, the fish just slide out into the weed bed and they're still very accessible. So it makes a tremendous fishery. Uh, we have a lot of big fish and just a lot of fish. I mean, uh, there, there are a couple different strategies. You can go hunt for big fish or you can just go fishing and they'll show up while you're catching all those other ones. Okay, we've got a question uh, from Brandon. Um, when it comes to pike flies, you find simpler patterns like whistlers work better than a complex pattern like the game changer. Uh, I'm going to let you answer that, Chip. Well, I, I fished with both and, and, and they both work. And, and for me, um, all of my flies are simple flies. And, and I would say that there are probably a few occasions where that little extra motion will make a difference. But I would say that 98% of the time, getting in front of a fish with a fly and working that fish and moving the fly, uh, a simple fly will do everything that a game changer will. Uh, there's going to be that odd time when, when that little extra kick will do it. Yeah. But it's, it's really, to be honest, for me, it's not enough to go from a fly that takes me four minutes to tie to one that takes me 25. 25 minutes for Game Changer, you're doing a lot better than I do, my friend, because I'm the guy who's bass fishing with a Game Changer and a bike bites me off and I want to drop to my knees and cry because I've lost a, that fly that took me an hour and a half to tie. But that's just me. I'm not the greatest tire. You're a lot better than I am, and I know you, you crank them up. Well, you have you have to keep in mind that even even when I tie a complex fly like a game changer, I still tend to simplify it. So my game changers don't have fins, they don't have eyes, they don't you know they they have the the, the elements that make it swim. Yeah. But but profile and action for me does way more than eyes or fins or those kinds of things for our kind of fishing. So uh, we're gonna come back to talking about uh, the location, the season, stuff like that. I got a video I want to play here in a second. But before we do that, uh, first, I want to say uh, to everyone that is watching, um, I know there's a lot of people here in Canada that aren't watching because everyone's watching Toronto Maple Leafs versus the Edmonton Oilers because they want to see that game and they're all pumped up. But at the same time, I know there's some people that uh, watch this uh, video later um, on YouTube or on Facebook and welcome everyone that's joining us and trying to learn more about pike fishing. And uh, we're talking about uh, Northern Saskatchewan. And we're at Cree River Lodge. I'm here with Chip, who's the, uh, I call him the the, the guru of uh, pike fishing because uh, uh, he's like me. He's addicted and he knows a lot more than I do. And uh, I, I, anyways, I'm just so thrilled to be uh, doing this with you. And I hope we can have you on again to talk about this because I got to get you in with Tom Rosenbauer on his podcast because I, I, I think he would love to talk to you about pike fishing. I did a, a, a podcast with him a number of years ago, probably like five, six years ago. And he told me he got a ton of questions after the, the podcast, which is good to hear. Anyways, I'm getting off on tangent. Let's watch a video, Chip, and uh, then we'll come back and talk again. So have a look at this, everyone. I think you'll enjoy this. Whoa! Whoa! There you go. <laughs> Holy smokes. Let's bring that one to the reel. All right, mama, let's see ya. <laughs> wow. Okay. Can I pop up here, John? Yeah, I'm gonna switch with you. Get out of your way. All right, here we go. Whew. Athletic stance. It's more like, oh, look at that fin. Yeah. This is my first really good size Northern Saskatchewan pike. Wow. We've been working the weed beds here for about half an hour. And we've seen a few small fish, but this is the first one of any size. And I'm so happy that Alex was the one to get it on her fly because I have been waiting for her to have the fight of a lifetime with one of these fish. 
It's so much fun to watch. I'm gonna bring her up. Holy mama! <laughs> yes! All right. That's a beautiful fish. Holy moly, Jenna! Can I yeah. pass you this? I'll take this for you. Whew. All right. Ready? <laughs> Amazing. Man, All right. nice. good job. Look at this. Beauty. That's <laughs> Absolutely All right. wicked. Oh. Bye, darling. Splash me. You ready? Ready. Mm -hmm. Bye, girl. Love ya. XOXO. How are you feeling? I feel pretty good. <laughs> that one worked me hard. That was a nice one. <laughs> so to recap what just happened to me there, I, uh, I was bringing the fly in right to the boat, let it dangle there for a second, looked up to wink at Jenna, Look back down to cast again and whoom, right on the fly, took it right out. The whole body just did a beautiful curve and it took a good, good chunk of time to get in. It just goes to show just, you really got to bring it right to the boat. Give it a couple seconds because they're watching even if you can't see them. Yeah, they're watching. Good job, Just like buddy. we are. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's give her. Let's do it again. All right, let's see if there's another one. Don't you love it when people are excited when they catch a good fish like that? That's one of one of the best things about being a guide, and 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 guiding is is all about the the gratifying things that you do. I mean, it, it's it's a it's a short it's it's a high. It's 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 addictive, and, and uh, it's it's why I still do it after all these years. Well, Chip, uh, and for everyone there. Uh, that was my daughter, Jenna, with the long hair, and Alex in the bow of the boat that caught the fish, Alex Parks, uh, who had never been to Saskatchewan to, to fish, so she was pretty pumped. And I don't think she had done pike fishing. She's pretty much a trout fisherman. This, this is a new experience for her. If she caught a, a pike, it'd be a little guy, probably on the Grand River or something like that. Nothing I, like it, what you just yeah, got her into. I, I think she'd caught a couple small ones bass fishing. And, and, but nothing, nothing of significance at all, for sure. And I don't oh. think she never pike fished. I think she just caught a couple incidentally. Yeah, by accident. And uh, I just want to put this up so everyone understands why dad's still very jealous of his daughter. Uh, that would be why I want to go to Cree River and fly fish for pike. Look at the size. That thing's a buffalo. It's huge. Absolutely gigantic. What's what, what, what was the length of that, Chuck? Do you or uh, Chip? Do you remember? That one was actually about forty-three or forty-four inches, but it was just incredibly thick, and and it was it was a really nice fish. Um, we we caught a pretty good number of really nice fish that trip. Um, the the thing that I remember most about that trip, besides the success that we had, was the fact that it was twenty mile an hour winds every day. And, and we were still able to fish successfully, even, even with that. Yeah. And, and I think, as I recall, you were, uh, we spoke, you know, later on after Jenna came back and she was very excited and you, you were disappointed because the next week some people came in fly fishing and they caught even bigger fish, much bigger fish. That's, I know that's the famous. You should have been here last week. Should have been. Oh, no, that's that's the, the curse before. of the camera most of the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you go out, uh, you know, ten days in a row and have spectacular days. You put a camera in the boat, and and you have to work twice as hard. But. Oh well. So um, I want to talk about subsurface, top water lines, all that. Um, and I, I guess the first thing, let before we even get into that, let's. Well, I don't know where to start. There's so many things to talk about here. Chip, I mean, we can make this two-hour show easily, but I, I don't want to do that. People that want to watch the hockey game. Um, I noticed one of the things I want to talk about right now, we were talking about fly lines earlier on and about floating lines. But I noticed that both Jenna and uh, and um, Alex were using intermediate lines. Um, it, we, we kind of fish the floating and inter intermediate kind of interchangeably for most of what we do. Um, you know, they're not fishing slow enough 
that you're going to get significantly more depth out of an intermediate. You're talking maybe a foot, 18 inches difference over the course of, of the cast. So it really doesn't matter that much. The intermediate does give you a little bit more flexibility if you do need to get down where you can mm -hmm. slow down, counter down for, you know, four or five seconds before you start and, and gain a couple extra feet. But most of what we're doing is fishing over top or, or in shallow water. Um, very, very seldom when I'm pike fishing, do I, do I need to get down? Mm -hmm. So uh, the pike will almost always come up and anything that you drag higher than them provides, that's the best silhouette you're ever going to get is against the sky. So, so they're going to see it. And, and if they're at all active, they'll come up for it. And I mean, that's, that's normal for a pike. They're, they're a predator fish and, and they do, they don't see below them. It's not, not like a walleye where they're looking to, to scrounge along the bottom most of the time. They're, everything is, is there or up. And so as long as you're above the fish, you're in the zone and, and they, they're going to see the fly. And, and for me, uh, the biggest difference when I'm trying to move fish is if, if I'm fishing a little bit later in the season in weed beds and I'm trying to pull fish out of eight feet of water, I still use a shallow running line. I just throw bigger flies. So I've got more silhouette. So it shows up better. Right. And probably slowing it down, which is um, uh, w what's unique about where you're fishing compared to other places um, with, that are much farther south. As the summer progresses and it gets warmer, those big pike tend to go deep, deep, deep. They're 30, 40 yeah, feet. We don't, we don't experience that. I mean, between, between the current and the, and the areas off of the current and, and, and just the, like you say, the shortness of the summer, uh, I, I'd never fish in more than about 12 feet of water ever. And I would say that I am running a full float 90% of the time. Okay. That's good to know. So let's talk about the seasons of the pike fishing uh, at the lodge and, and like, because you're so far the North where, you know, I know friends of mine that go pike fishing here in Ontario and they really target pike and right after the season opener in the spring, because they know as it warms up, the pike, generally the bigger pike go deeper and you'll have the smaller, you know, eight pounds and under kind of pike in the shallows. And of course there's exceptions to the rule, but when it gets warmer. So tell us about the seasons of the pike fishing at Cree River. Well, you have to keep in mind that, that we're far enough north that ice off for us is like June 1st. So when you think about Ontario, you know, you're talking about May fishing and, 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 and so you've, you've already gained or lost a month, depending on how you look at it. But mm -hmm. um, we essentially get your May and your September, and we don't get your June, July, and August. Our June, July, and August is, you know, my water temps will rarely exceed 75 degrees, even in the shallowest water. So mm -hmm. there, there are times when even at, at the, you know, at the, at the, shallowest stuff we're going to get fish in there in june and july and august um june is very june is very uh, uh solar driven um the sun warms the water you get that temperature gradient and the fish will move into the shallows and and that is very much dictated by the weather if if you come in june you have the potential for the best but also for the toughest fishing if if you come in june you get a cloudy day and you get no sun the fish are all going to hold in deeper water in the current and, mm -hmm. and they're going to be down with the walleyes. And that, that classic sight fishing thing that you do when the sun shines and the fish all move up into two feet of water only happens when the sun shines. For us, July still gives us those fish in the shallows. They're not all in the back of the bay, but there are always fish in those spots. They're, they're readily accessible. And to be honest, um, I kind of prefer when there's not 75 fish per every hundred square feet of water, because I can throw a fish at a fly and have a chance to catch that fly and not have to catch five or six little ones before I can actually work the big fish. So, uh, you know, again, that's, that's, I, I guess the hunter in me and, and, and I, I've never been the kind of fisherman that, that lets a line run out the back and wait and see what happens. I'm always looking, chasing, trying to find, and that's, that's just how, how I've always fished. And, and, I, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a polling platform on my boat and I spend quite a bit of time up there because I like to see what's going on and I like to, to get in the shallows and, and find the fish that way and work the fish. So that's, that's always been one of my, my, my things. The, one of the things that I've enjoyed the most about pike fishing. And the fact is it's so visual, even when you're not 
sight fishing the fish, you're seeing that fish follow. You're seeing that fish strike 90 plus percent of the time. So yeah. it, it's very visual. It's very entertaining in that way. Well, uh, you, that's one of the reasons I like pike. And uh, as I, I tell friends who haven't pike fish, that pike don't nibble. They just, <laughs> they just take. And sometimes well, those takes can be pretty ferocious, uh, especially on top water. Yeah, the, the, I guess they do a little bit of everything. I've had pike come up behind and sip things just like, you know, like you'd never expect. But the ones I like are those big toilet bowl flush type hits where the water just blows up and, and everything just goes, yeah, it's. Yeah. So I've got, I think it's time for another video. Let's put this video up. We'll come back and talk. I mean, we can go off on lots of tangents here because I'm very excited about what we're talking about, but let's have a video and uh, we'll see a little bit more about why uh, Northern Saskatchewan is such a special place. After so much success in the morning, Alex and I split up into separate boats to cover more water. Chip took us downriver to hit another spot or two before heading back to the lodge for the evening. Nice big fish running your rod tip. Really? Jesus, that's a big one. Oh, I see him. He's on my fly. Nice. Yes. Oh, wow, that was. Keep that tight, awesome. tight. Lots tight, of tension. Tight. Okay, Not okay. a good hook set. Good okay. tension. Keep good tension on it. That is a very. Holy cow. Don't that's shake that up. Down, 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 down. <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Yep, tension, tension. There we go, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna try and get this guy on the reel. There we go. We haven't right, been in on. this bay. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. This gal was probably just sunning herself. We've got some really nice sun today. Wow. Okay, that is a pretty looking fish. Thanks for the tip. I didn't even see her there until you pointed her out. I pulled my fly right in front of her mouth and a couple little strips, little paws. Oh yeah, that's the stuff. Man, they fight, they fight so well here, holy cow. What a backdrop for a fish like this too. I know. Ow! <laughs> Active. That's good, wear yourself out doing that jumping stuff. There we go, that's right. Oh yeah. What a well, <laughs> gorgeous fish. Nice Thank one. you so much Chip for pointing that nice out. Work. Let's see if we can find any older sisters. All right. She do a release Back in there. she goes. Whoa! Well, she, uh, she wanted to go. She did not like that anymore. <laughs> Holy cow! Nice work. Thanks, Chip. I, I just have, an, I have no words. It's one of the reasons I love fishing in northern Saskatchewan. I love coming to Cree River Lodge and getting to fish with Chip. It's just, every fish is a fish of a lifetime. It's just so much fun. It's cool. I thought I saw another one there. <laughs> okay, well, let's stop talking and get fishing. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't make it into the clip, but the one after was bigger. Of course. <laughs> I picked I thought, the wrong one. I thought it was the same fish um, when we drifted over. Like, we just basically pulled off the shore and started fishing again. And I thought it was the same fish, but then when it got a little bit closer, I saw it had a different mark. And so, you know, I wasn't even going to have Jenna fish at it because it looked, I thought it was just the one I'd released. And then, like I said, when we saw the mark on it, we, she put a cast on it and it ate too. So, but wow. that, that was a pretty good day that day. Well, let's talk about uh, this the sight fishing because I, I equate it to bone fishing, uh, to fly fishing for carp. Um, it, it's like watching a big brook trout come up and eat a mouse pattern on the surface. Sight fishing is what juices us in fly fishing a lot. I mean, you can nymph, you can throw streamers, but even with the streamers, because the water is relatively clear and they follow, you're going to see a lot of the eats. Just like when I'm stripping in a, a streamer fast for a brown trout and I'll see that fish hit. It's, it's such a visual thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? And you've got the perfect boats I noticed there, plus the fact you've got the platform, but you've got the perfect boats at that lodge. Tell me a little bit about the, the sight fishing. Well, um, you know, I mean, pike is so ideal for fly fishing in so many ways. I mean, there, there are lots of them. You get lots of chances. They get really big. And so that, you know, they make a, they make a very impressive catch. They have attitude. They, they, they eat things with, with the intent to kill them. I mean, when they come after something, there's no fooling around and, and they do like to follow 
and they are one of the few fish that you can actually work that you can you can react to how the fish reacts to what you do if that makes sense and so you start stripping and you can watch the fish follow and the fish uh you know will will be interested in things that you do or not interested if you know if you speed it up Sometimes that'll trigger a bit of a, a more intense reaction. Sometimes if you let it drop and that's not what they want, they'll kind of fold their fins back and turn away a little bit. And, and, and you can still, you know, get that fish again, but it, it's just a matter of, because you can see, you can actually work the fish. So when you do something that it likes, do it again. When you do something that it doesn't like it, don't do that anymore. I mean, it's pretty straightforward when you get that many chances and you get to see so much of what's going on. And the biggest issue that we have, to be honest, is that a lot of people don't see fish well. Either they don't have good glasses or, and I mean, part of it is that, you know, we spend so much time on the water, we know what to look for and we know where to look and we can see what's going on all the time. So you're always going to see more than your anglers do. But, but a lot of people don't invest in a good pair of glasses. And it's really important for something that's as visual as pike. You will enjoy your fishing a whole lot more if you have a good pair of glasses so that you can see what's going on. So uh, one of the people, Howard, uh, that's uh, watching our, our uh, event tonight, is talking about how he caught a 36-inch pike, which is a great size pike. Um, and he used the Northern Magic. <laughs> it's uh, uh, my daughter got me onto that fly after uh, uh, my seeing it in her video. Oh, there it is right there. Look at that. That's, that's I don't think it gets any simpler than that there, uh, Chip. No, I, I can tie that fly. <clears throat> Last time the girls were there, I think I tied that fly blindfolded just for a really? kick. Yeah, and that, that's how simple it is. And and uh, yeah, it if, if I'm tying, I can knock one of those out in about uh, two and a half, three minutes. I mean, it's just... It's very, very simple. And, and like I said, I, I started tying that fly in the late 80s, and I still fish that fly today. Well, it's a great fly. I've used it now, and I really, really like it. And uh, I'm going to put up some patterns here. I might have to – how's that? Okay, here. Put on the light. It's going to blow it out a bit here, but how's that? Can you see? There we go. This one right here with the red, the black. And you can really see the red in the front. I think it's too hot, actually. Let me just yeah. change that. That's better. Okay. And that's one, of course. Uh, Chip, you tied this one for me, which has oh, yeah. got dumbbell eyes on it. Which, by the way, uh, open your loop, ladies and gentlemen, when you're casting this fly, because otherwise uh, you're going to have a bad day if you hit yourself in the back of the head if the wind goes the other way. And, no, and, no, and no. Tracy's asking about what size hooks to use here. Can you talk about that? Uh, like, what size is? What is the average? range of hook sizes you're using for flies here? Yeah, like I, I use a couple of different flies. Like this would be about as small a fly as I will tie. And that's that's a bait fish pattern and that'll be on a two-aught hook. So that's kind of where, that's that's as small as I'll tie. And then the Northern Magic that I had there, that's on a four-aught. Um, this, this poor man's Whistler here, that's yep. also on a four-aught hook. So the, it's, it's, it's a pretty good size hook. It's, uh, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of gape there. It's there's not, there. yeah, yeah, exactly. You, and, want, you want a wider gape, don't you, generally? Generally speaking, it depends on the materials. I mean, you can get to stuff like this, you know, where you, where you have a yeah. very good-sized articulated fly. And That's this, about as big as I like to cast, which yeah, is what you have there, right? This, this one is very, very light, actually. It casts really well. But, but typically... I, I do go above a four aught occasionally. The problem that I run into is that if, if you get into six aught hooks, ten, typically they tend to have heavy wire. And the problem with the heavy wire is they make a big hole. And, yeah. and uh, A, it's, it's hard to get a good hook set, but B, if it does go somewhere soft, it's going to make a big hole. And so I prefer moderately fine wire hooks. Um, the, a, a lot of the new ones now are coming out with a, a predator style hook or a spinnerbait trailer style hook or something like that, um, that has a, a, a very nice round, uh, very, very like forged, very rigid type hook. Uh, I don't like the, uh, the soft wire um, hooks, uh, some of the untempered ones, they, they bend. And, and I like a hook that has a, a good point and, 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 and holds its shape really well. Um, so like the, I used the ads wire hooks for a while, for example, and, and they're a great hook, 
but but they're soft and and uh, so it, I, I much prefer something that that's forged that's that's quite rigid. Uh, the one that I currently use right now, and there's a, a number of, of similar ones, but this one is a uh, uh, it's a VMC uh, 7341, which this is a four odd, but it's sized about like a six odd. Uh, the gape is really wide, and yet uh, the wire is very similar to a, like a four odd O'Shaughnessy style hook. Yes, and, and uh, some other hooks for people that are out there and interested that I that I really like. The VMC are, are good. I don't have a whole lot of experience, but the few I've used have been really good. Uh, Partridge was making some really interesting pike hooks that were barbless, uh, wide gap. But see, I never had one bend or twist on me. And um, as well, Eric has come out with some hooks. Now, you, what was the brand? Eric is, yeah, I, I don't use Eric's hooks, but they are all over it. And I mean, there, there are a bunch of really good tires that that are that use Eric all the time. And, and they make a number of really good hooks. They just tend to be, I tend to buy my hooks in bulk. And, yeah. and, and so I, I, I spend 20 or 30 cents a hook instead of 95 or a dollar or whatever, but I tie more flies than your average guy. So it, it, it adds up. That's true. Now, one thing uh, we should talk about uh, just quickly. Um, I don't know what your opinion is about this. I have mine, but I, my opinion is I don't like to use saltwater hooks because some people will tie their pike flies with a saltwater hook. And I tend to go away from that because if by any chance somehow I lose the, the, the fish, it breaks it off and that I, I want the hook to rot away. And that's the one thing. But what's your opinion about this ship? Well, I don't currently tie on anything stainless. Yeah. But I do tie on a number of hooks that are called saltwater hooks that are only good for about a week in salt water before they rust anyway. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I mean, you take like a perma steel or the, the black nickel coating or whatever. Those are, they're not true salt water hooks. Um, I tie very, very few flies on, on those premium hooks, like, a, a, a you know, an owner or, a, you know, the, the, the very expensive, very sharp. Um, the, the reality is that our fish, uh, you know, the pike typically don't need a super, super sharp hook. If you have a reasonably sharp hook that that grabs, their, their mouths are soft compared to a lot of the saltwater fish that these guys are trying to stick. And and so typically a, a decently sharp hook is enough. I mean, the advantage of a super sharp hook is that it doesn't slide at all. Wherever it touches, it grabs. And and if if the hook is a little bit dull, Typically, it will slide a bit before it grabs. It needs more of a crevice or a corner. Um, and I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So I tend to try and use fairly sharp hooks. Mm -hmm. But um, when I was fishing the ad swire hook, one of the things that I noticed was that it functioned a lot like a circle hook um, for a lot of the, the fish that would hit where you couldn't see them, that they yeah, would hit in the corner and they would get hit in the corner of the mouth all the time. Yeah. I've heard uh, some other anglers are using those and they like the circle hooks for that very reason, because of uh, the fact that pike have got that big shovel mouth. And a lot of times when they come down on a fly like this, it'll turn sideways in their mouths because of the pressure, downward pressure. And what's good about the circle hooks is that when you strip set and the fish is turned away, it'll go right in the corner of the mouth, right? The, the, the operative thing being when the fish turns away. <laughs> <laughs> that's right and we both know sometimes they don't i've had that happen with musky way too many times but that's one other subject um what i'm going to do first of all i want to address steve has asked a, a question about uh sunglasses since you brought it up and i think it's real important for us to talk about this because i'm i'm a huge fan of spending the money to have good sunglasses um one because it helps you see fish but i also i want to have my eyes uh working and functioning well for a long time and the glare all the things and we you know i'm the whitest guy in canada and i wear a lot of sunscreen and buffs and all that i worry about my eyes too and all the glare we're getting from the the sky so why don't you give your recommendations on what you like obviously you want them polarized but what's your recommendations about sunglasses well the problem that i have is that i'm pretty much blind as a bat without a prescription so when you when you throw a prescription into the equation then you're you really limit uh, your good options. And I've had really good luck with Maui Jim. 
And mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that I like the Maui's is that my prescription, I can get it in glass. And, and the clarity of glass makes all the difference. And, and there are a lot of good sunglasses, but I have two issues. I have one, I have a fairly strong prescription. And the other is I have no bridge. My nose is just this straight ramp and, and plastic frames won't stay up on it. So I okay. really, really am limited as to where I can find frames. And my Maui gyms have nose pads, so they stay up on my face really well. Um, I've tried Costa. I've tried uh, a couple other brands of, 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 you know, very, very good glasses. Problem for me, Costa is plastic. Um, in my prescription, it's plastic and it makes a difference. I have a pair of Costas that I wear kind of interchangeably with my Maui gyms, but I find probably 80% that I wear the Maui gyms. Um, there are a number of other good brands. And to be honest, fit is probably almost as important as you know, because they're, they're, if you look at any of the major sunglasses manufacturers, uh, they're all making a quality product. But if you if, if the frame doesn't fit on your face, it won't do you any good. If you've got big gaps where lights getting in, if it's sliding down on your face, if, it's, if you can't be comfortable, the glasses should just be part of you. You shouldn't have to you should never think about your glasses when you're fishing. And if you're always pushing them up or if you're always having to tilt your head a certain way to see or if you're always having to block the, the light out the side, you're never going to have a good experience with them. So I would say find a brand that you're comfortable with, but find a pair that fits. The fit is the fit is key. Okay. So a uh, few things before I want to put on a video again. We, we need to watch some more pike action and stuff like that. But um, just to a couple of points about sunglasses, my personal opinion, and I'm not getting into brands because, you know, something Costa, Smith, I mean, I wear Smiths a lot. Um, Maui Jim, they're all, like you said, they're all good. But I think what's real important here is the coloration of the glass you use. Uh, obviously polarized, but I like having a spectrum, like the heavy dark ones if I'm saltwater fishing, uh, going to the bronzy copper for more stained water, darker days to even the grays. So if I had to pick one, because I mean, Sunglasses are expensive for prescription, like you were talking about. I mean, that's insane. But, you know, you can spend three and $400 for a regular pair of sunglasses, good sunglasses. Um, if I had to pick one, I'd have to say my personal opinion is I like the bronze a lot because it's kind of like in between everything. And on those dark, cloudy days, a little bit of stain in the water, I can still discern fins, a tail, the things you were talking about, spotting fish, and they seem to be a good overall. That's my personal opinion. But yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty generally accepted for 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 the shallow water type of fishing that we do. Is that the bronze or the amber or even possibly a bit of a rose tint or something in that kind of a range? adds a little contrast the uh the blue water guys tend to like the grays and, and 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 whatnot more for more glare and and but they're not really trying to separate a fish from the bottom as much and so i think that that like you say that the the, the bronze amber that kind of a coloration and usually um when you're getting fishing glasses that's usually going to be the ones with the green mirror on the front and then they have the the bronze yeah. or amber on the back <laughs> yeah true uh Last thing I want to say uh, about sunglasses, so two points real quick. One, uh, don't do what I have done, which is not wearing a choker or a strap on the sunglasses and then, you know, catching a big fish and bending over to get it and or whatever. And you hear Bloop, and 40 feet of water. Bye bye sunglasses. Uh, that's just it's the best 10 or 15 bucks you'll ever spend getting those straps or a choker. Uh, they even have ones that float. And then the second thing I want to say, you made a really good point. People do not buy sunglasses off the internet. Go take the time, go try them on. Just like you said, Chip, I have a narrow face. You have a relatively narrow face. I've got a thin nose. Uh, uh, everyone's face is different. Everyone's the fit of the glasses is different. It's real important to try them to find the comfort. And if you wear, if you get the glass ones, um, and by the way, Costa does make glass ones. The five eight zeros are are, are glass, um, but they're heavier. They're, they're well, heavier they, glasses. Yeah. They do make glass, but not in my prescription. No, no. no again, it, it depends upon your prescription. So you're a whole different kettle of fish. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But but I guess the point is, it, you, the point you made is so valid because 
I remember somebody giving me glasses and they didn't fit my face. They just, they were uncomfortable. I knew, I knew they were on my face all day and they dug in and I had little marks in my head and stuff. You got to try them, feel that. And like you said, they should be a part of you. You don't, it's like having your ball cap on. You don't even remember it's on your head. It's just there. Right. And it's so important to protect your eyes. Okay. And yeah. And I mean, bad sunglasses are better than no sunglasses, but good sunglasses will, you'll never go back once you wear worn a good pair of sunglasses. Don't buy your sunglasses at the dollar store. It's all set. <laughs> okay. Let's watch a video. I think everyone's uh, wanting to watch a video. So let's go to another great video from Cree River Lodge. After one. so much success in the morning. Right? Nope. I forgot to remove that one. I'm so excited from the last video. There we go. The reality for me is like I say, you just come and go fishing and you'll catch fish. And it doesn't have to be hard. Um, it's mostly not hard. The weather has not very much impact on what you're doing. Uh, the big big wind tr just means you, you pick a spot that's out of the wind. But when you're on a small lake with lots of little bays and river channels and whatnot, we catch a bunch of fish right here in the river. Uh, and especially as the season progresses, um, the weeds come up and the fishing in the river gets better and better. So by the end of the season, um, there are big fish to be caught within five minutes of camp. So. Uh, depending on how many people are in camp, we have uh, five cabins on the, on the waterfront and one back behind. So that's 23 beds. But the cabins normally have two bedrooms and two beds in each room. And a full camp for us is usually about 14 people. So there's a lot of flexibility in managing uh, people and their needs. If you're looking to book a trip Cree River Lodge, um, when you should book has a lot to do with how flexible you are. Uh, if you need very specific dates, then probably you should be looking a year in advance to book your trip. Uh, last minute trips are, that you're really pushing the, the chances there. I would say that it's best probably to have everything locked in a couple of months before the summer rolls around. I think you said a lot there, Chip. Uh, a lot of great advice about uh, what you have and, and, you know, how many people can you take the camp at a time in terms of rods? We like to be about 12. Uh, we can do 14. Anything more than that gets awkward. But typically we run uh, one pontoon boat, which is kind of an oddball thing for a northern Canada fishing lodge. But yeah. we have a lot of guests that enjoy that because it allows them to fish three or four together and makes more of a family trip. Obviously the hardcore guy is going to want to be in a boat with only one other angler, but it's amazing how popular that particular uh, setup is. But uh, other than that, there's a half a dozen boats. So, I mean, we can go to 14 people pretty easily, but uh, it's, you know, at any time it's, I'm like everybody else. I'd like to be the only boat. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you get out there and, and, and there's enough room to separate around and you get together for lunch, you see how everybody did. And, and then we just kind of spread out again. And, and, uh, you know, on the lake, it's, it's small, it's close, but there's a lot of water to fish. And so you get a chance to get on, uh, you know, some really quality fishing, uh, without a long boat ride, without big waves. Um, it's, it's really, uh, I, I, I think of it as being very easy. I came off a lake that was huge, 800 square miles. I'd seen waves that were eight, nine, 10 feet. Um, where I am now, if I see two foot waves, I see them for 10 minutes and then I don't have to see them anymore. So it's, it's, it's really easy. And, and, and uh, I told Pat when I, when I came to work for him, I said, this is, I, I kind of consider this semi-retired because it's easy. And uh, you know, there's fish everywhere. We get, million walleyes you can even catch walleye on a fly rod if you want to and i don't know if uh if you have that clip or not but we did that too and uh yeah, yeah it's just it's there's a lot of fish and it's, it's a very enjoyable kind of fishing with an opportunity to do special things well you dovetail that nicely into the next video let's have a watch brought us back up river to another favorite spot known as the crater to continue our hunt for monster northern pike 
This is the crater. It's kind of a neat piece of structure, isn't it? We're gonna fish a gravel bar here. It's a current break just coming off the rapids coming in and then a big gravel shelf. So you're gonna to wanna to keep it up just a little bit. And then we'll get done with this. We're gonna work down around that side and it gets a little bit deeper over there. So we'll be able to drop the fly down a little bit more. But right now, just kind of let it go down maybe two, three feet is all. And any more than that, and you'll hang on the rocks. Oh, I'm ready for the crater chip. <laughs> I am ready. Let's get it done. I'm ready too. Let's see what she does. Where's the sun? Come on, sun. We're at the mercy of them fish. Sun comes out a little bit, which it should right away here. It's a big cloud, but it's coming. Nice. But what I want you to do as you're working this is just try and fan your cast a little bit. So every cast, you know, 10, 9, 8, 10, 9, 8, boom, boom, boom. And that just covers more just water. Just cover more water, absolutely. absolutely. Awesome. We're fishing flat. We're not fishing any little individual structure, so they're going to be possibly anywhere. Take it. Fish That's on. Fish. Holy smokes, you're a largey. Okay, come this way, girl. Priority there one, we go. Back rod. Priority two, crank the reel handle. Oh, fish. Nice. What a double header, eh, Alex? Awesome. Good fish, Jenna. This was incredible. It was a slow action eat, just a little bit of twitching not too fast. A really common mistake is to stop the fly and let it sit there because you want it to eat it, but they're looking to chase. They are massive predators in this area. Not too fast, not too slow. And there you got it going on. Mm, that is a good fish. We have no words. <laughs> this is just exceptional. Beauty. Northern Saskatchewan, Cree River Lodge, exceptional pike. And just so much fun. Right on. All right, buddy, let's get these, let's get these big girls back, back in, in the, the water. water. Okay. Yeah! Yeah, I was laughing the whole time I was watching it. I just wanted to be there so bad. Swinging flies. And we, and we haven't even talked about top water. Let's talk about top water quick. Because I got some flies here I really like to use. It, is there a period or a time that the top water is really good for the pike? There, there is. Um, but typically for me, top water is much more of an action thing than a, than a big fish hunting thing. Yeah. Um, but that's... It's probably more in my head than it is reality. Um, I've, I've always been a streamer guy. I, I can remember back way, way, way back. I had this discussion with a couple of relatively notable fishermen along the way. And, and, I, and nobody ever convinced me that they could catch more big fish on a popper than I could on a streamer. Um, but that being said, a, a popper is a whole lot of fun. And, um, you know, the, the, from a guide's perspective, you know, we'll go out there and we'll get 25 hits and, and the guys will think they had an awesome afternoon, which I mean, it's, it's all entertainment, right? But they only caught five of them. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it's a hits, it's, it's the activity. It's, it's all this stuff going on. Um, we were trying to get some top water hits with Jenna. I remember, and, and uh, we had a, a really, really nice fish come and, and missed the fly by probably a foot and a half. And, and, uh, but you know, it was a great hit and we got a great, great shot of it on the camera, but, but I don't know why they have so much trouble tracking the top water compared to a streamer. So the hookups are always going to be less. And one of the things that I've started doing is, is using an articulated popper. So you can either take a, a, a any streamer fly and, and put a shank on the front and put a popper on it, or even have some tube poppers. I just keep in the box. And, and you just slide the wire through it, put it on the front of, again, any streamer fly. And all of a sudden you've got a popper and the, the popper is not inhibiting the hook, hookability of the fly. And I, I, it helps a little bit, but some of it's just that they miss. Uh, uh, but there, it's, it's hard to beat a good topwater hit. It really is.
Uh, I'm not going to disagree with anything you just said. Uh, I have, and I've seen many, and you're right, compared to a bass, say, or a trout, pike miss top waters a lot. And that's not even going fast. I don't know uh, how they chase down ducklings and muskrats and things like that, but they do miss a lot. But I got to tell you, it, it really gets your heart going. It, it's fantastic. I have to show a fly here that is my personal favorite for uh, uh, top water. And it's only because it's so easy to cast, has a great silhouette. Uh, Stuart Thompson from Manitoba. And I'm, I'm sure you met Stu before or you know of him. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, Weedman's, uh, Weedman's Slider. Deer okay. hair, simple tail. This one's yep. really been hammered. That's why it's lost a lot of the tail, but a little bit of flash in it. Here's another one. And I've used this a lot in Northern Ontario and Labrador. Um, and of course, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, just a wicked fly. And what's cool about these flies compared to some of the ones, and you know what I'm talking about, like uh, Larry Dalberg's uh, fly, Dalberg diver. If you tie the proper side, it's, it's a, it's a bit of a beast to cast. And I've, I've got some from uh, uh, Brad Beefus and some others who, what's the one he, he calls it, Thunder Chicken. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's got a big chunk of foam at the top. But they're just monsters to cast. Yeah. And, and they, they, they do work. But I like this. I could cast this thing on a five weight. And on a nine weight, it's so easy to do. The only you have to, to, to keep in mind is every once in a while, you got to put some more floating into it, soak it in. And I've actually learned a really good I, you know idea somebody passed on to me is with these deer hair flies um i take them and i spray them with a 3m uh, water repellent and soak it in I'll, and i'll put like five of them in a row spray them top spray them bottom let them sit for a few hours come back and do it again and i'm telling you it just seems to absorb enough of that um, uh, silicone that it they, they stay buoyant even though you've caught three or four fish I, th I think that that style of fly is a little bit better because it anchors into the water a bit. So they don't blow it up when they come up with a big hit. A lot of times the fly kind of stays put better. And so they do have a little better chance of hooking up with that one. The foam stuff that floats really high, especially if you take like a banger or something like that, that has no, uh, no fly in the water, just has the, the popper yeah. and a little bit of a tail they, they move so easy. And, and so when the fish comes up on it, a lot of times I think they just knock it out of the way because there's nothing holding that fly there. And if you, if you have a fly like that or something with uh, enough streamer on the back of it, that it has a bit of an anchor that it stays put in the water better. I think you do catch more fish that way. I agree. All right, let's go to another video. And I think you're going to like this one. Chip brought us back up river. Did it again. <laughs> I guess I'm so excited to talk to you, Chip. Hang on. Well, we I wanted to go fishing this year. I wanted to go someplace exclusive, high end. And I was a little concerned. I saw the website and, you know, you always worry that the thing is going to be overhyped. I never caught a big pike and so I went and it has exceeded all expectations. The vast majority of the time it was sight fishing. I actually saw the pike take my fly and that is something else. You see this big thing come up and just take it and then you set my hook as hard as you can. And it's often right there like a rod length and a half uh, away from you. I'm already planning on coming back next year, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I thought we should put that in because uh, we've been talking about Jenna and Alex and certainly my love of wanting to come up there and want to go there. But, uh, you know, just wanted to put a soundbite from somebody else that came to the lodge when Jenna was there and he gave his perspective. He Again, uh, one of the things that, you know, as a consumer and you're out there and you're trying to judge amongst all the places advertising where to go, 
you know, and it's, it's tough. It's tough. Everyone says they're the best. I'm not saying they're not, but it's just, it's nice. And he was there. And Jenna said you couldn't wipe a smile every night at dinner time off his face. He just had so much fun. Well, I, I mean, you, you know, you go to the sports shows and everybody has everything. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's, I've always been lucky that I, that I've worked at really top end resorts that had, you know, that could, could back it up. And, and, but when you go to the show and you talk to people and everybody does have good fishing, at least some of the time. Um, and there, there isn't a place in business that I know of that doesn't have spectacular fishing if you hit it exactly right. The, the, I think the thing is the better lodges have a bigger window to hit it above what you expect to hit in terms of the, your expectations, in terms of catching fish. And, and you know, a place that, that sees, you know, a couple hundred anglers a year um, that has as many big fish as we do, the opportunities are really there. And, and you know, not everybody catches big fish every day, but I think everybody pretty much without exception sees big fish every day. And so they're, they're always there. And, and, and I mean, fishing is fishing in the sense that, you know, there are times when everything goes right. And there are times when things don't necessarily go as right as they could, yeah. but, but I would so much rather see and not catch than not see and not catch. And we always, I, I don't go out, any day that I can think of, unless, you know, you know, unless I'm wearing a rain gear and I'm sitting in the back of the boat kind of trying not to get rained on because it's 20 mile an hour winds and, and, you know, an inch every hour or whatever. But typically in a day's fishing, I'm going to see big fish every day. And, and so you're going to have opportunities. And that's just, like I say, the, the, the better places have more opportunities. And Cree River Lodge is one of those places. So uh, Tracy's asked a question. She's asking about leaders for pike fishing. Um, I'd like to get your opinion. I have my personal preference, but why don't you, Chip, explain what your setup is on a typical weight forward nine floating line, nine or 10 foot rod, um, medium to, I, I'd probably use a faster action rod for uh, casting the flies. Uh, which, what, what's your leader setup? Well, I I am not a fluorocarbon guy. And, and I have seen too many fish cut a fluorocarbon. And, and so in my boat, we use wire. And, and I mean, I can, I can tell you, there was a, a long time guest of mine. Uh, this is 20 years ago now, but uh, was the year that Spro came out with the 80 pound test fluorocarbon musky leaders. And, and Bill was all excited. We were going to have this awesome thing. They were going to, they were not going to be able to see the wire. It was going to be incredible. We had lost three 40 plus inch fish in a row. Every one of them cut the, cut the, the wire and i mean it was just the worst possible luck that you could imagine but yeah. it so convinced me that it's you know you get guys catch big pike on six pound test and, and it can happen but you could walk across the freeway with a blindfold on and not get by not get hit by a car too it's just <laughs> the odds are that eventually it's going to happen so for me it's wire and my leaders are typically very simple i need two things i need the wire on the end I need probably six feet overall, and I need to have something in there that will break at less than what a fly line breaks at. Because if something's going to break, I don't want to break a fly line. So I, I usually go down to 20 pound test or 25 pound test somewhere in there. So I'll go 50, 25, and then 15 inches of uh, 49 strand, like seven by seven uh, American fishing wire or I have started playing a little bit with uh, titanium leaders and the fast hatch type clip. Mm -hmm. but I don't know that I am in a position to say that that's the way to go. I do plan to use it again this year. I used them last year to pretty good effect yeah. and uh, you get guys that like to change flies all the time and it's, it's quick and easy. And the other thing with wire is typically if you get the wrong fish, the last six inches of wire gets a curl in it and you've got to retie anyway. So very, very need, um, some kind of wire and either, like I say, a, 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 a very flexible, knottable wire, um, like a, you say the American fishing wire. And I think uh, scientific anglers uses their wire. Or I think Orvis might use their wire. There's a number of different, like they, they market to a, a bunch of different ones, but um, it's just something that you can tie a knot in. And uh, I'm not a fan of, of, uh, you know, a regular leader, 
But in a, in a pinch, a regular leader will work. What I would recommend, though, is that you clip the swivel off, leave the loop on the wire, and then do a loop-to-loop -loop connection there. Then you don't get the swivel and, and that extra flex, and your, and your fly will lay out a whole bunch better. And you can use a wire leader uh, it, as a stopgap or like a, as a, an emergency if you need something. Because you're way better off to have a leader on there than just to have monofilament. Okay, Chip. So we, we, we've got a lot of agreement in the way I've kind of, from learning from guides like you, uh, but what works, and I'm very much into the KISS principle of keeping it simple, stupid, because, uh, you know, I've, I've seen these formulas that people come up with for pike leaders. It's like, why? You don't need to do that. But anyways, that's just my opinion. So and I can see by the curl on your lip, you've got one there too. But anyways, let, let's, let's get into, I'm going to tell you what I do. And uh, Tracy and everyone else is watching. You might have a different opinion. The one thing I will definitely say is I, I've tried – like you said, in a pinch, using the ones that conventional tackle anglers uh, use that could be 12 inches to 18 or 24 inches with the swivels. Don't use, don't use, don't use, especially with top water. You're going to pull the fly out. But that's one part of it. The other part of it is uh, that you mentioned was um, I'm in an area where we have a lot of muskie and I fly fish for muskie and, and spin fish and I have friends. That, I agree with you. 80 pound fluorocarbon leaders. I've seen the the muskie cut them just, and I know the pike will do it too. So, and the, the clips, there's some new clips that have come out. Virtually, I don't have some here uh, that I've tried and I haven't had any open up on me. And for anybody watching, if you try to, if you, if you get poor quality clips to use with your wire leader, they will bend them open. They will. It's not if, they will. Um, Scientific Anglers has come up with some new heavy duty clips and they rate them by, amount of pressure to open them up but i i kind of subscribe to I, I just like knots i i just i like to tie them. that's my personal opinion and this is uh here's rio uh this is 40 pound but i'm like you um this is not this is an audible wire i think it's seven strand or nine strand uh i use 20 pound i don't use 40 and just for everybody watching i have caught my biggest muskies 51 inches and I've never had this stuff break, never had it break, um, even at 20 pounds. You don't need the 40. The 20, 30 are good because they're easy to tie knots with. They're so easy. And I usually use a non-slip mono knot. So I get a nice loop to the streamer or even the top water so it has good action. That that knot and that, and that wire leader does not break. I'm like you. Um, I like to use a, a heavy mono. Uh, this is 40 pound trilene and I think this, this was like $15 for 370 yards. I like using this for one reason. I do six feet, maybe eight at the most, but six feet generally loop to loop to my fly line. And then I put another loop on this and then I put 18 to 24 inches to this. Or Scientific Anglers now has this, which I really like. This, uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, Chip. Absolute Predator figure eight. Uh, Pre-built kit, loop-to-loop. -loop. But I put that on. And again, loop-to-loop. -loop. And I like the, the, the heavy mono. It's not about breaking. It's the way it, it the energy. No, it I, I really agree. It lays out and, a fly beautifully. Yeah. And as long as you use 20-pound wire, you can use anything you want for mono. Right. But if you're using 40 or 50 pound wire, then you have to have a chunk of mono in there that'll break. Right. So for me, I, I want this to help get the energy of the fly out with these bigger flies. And then, like you said, if you're going to use the wire like I've got here, uh, and it, it's so easy to tie. But yes, 20 pound or go to the clip thing. Because, you know, uh, even if it is a 50 pound rated clip, I guarantee you, you put a little twist on that thing and it's going to go pop and it's going to open up. Well, one way, because if you hook a log or you hook something, you got to get that line out and you don't want to break your fly line. Right. right. That'd be the absolute worst thing. Okay. So I'm going to play. And oh, I, here's something else I want to mention. Uh, this wire cutters. Make sure you bring those. I don't care if they're scissors, whatever. And I know you'll have them in the boat, uh, Chip, but I think it's real important to have these. Obviously, you know, having, uh, long uh, uh, forceps. I don't even like forceps. I like heavy with a bend in it uh, pliers. I can go down there for the odd pike. And, and we both know 90% of the time, 
it's not the big pipe that have it deep. It's the little guys, the little snot rockets that are like 18 inches to 12 inches long. They're going to take it down. And they're the ones you have the problems and, and they'll cut you up so bad if you put your hand in there to try and reach it. And it's not long enough. But this this isn't for doing that. This is just for cutting wire. Just put it real clear. I, I'm a big fan of, of the quote unquote fly fishing pliers. The, uh, the, I use, I call them rigging pliers. They are, you know, the aluminum ones with the, with the steel inserts for the jaws or whatever, but something that will allow you to, to, to do all of the aspects of rigging, pulling your knots tight, cutting your wire, cutting your monofilament, all of those things, uh, a good pair of fly fishing pliers. And you don't have to spend big bucks. You can get decent fly fishing pliers in that $50 range and under. Um, but I, I do believe that there are a lot of things that it's worthwhile. And usually they have a loop in the handle that you can pull on your hook with. And there, there's just a bunch of things that I, I've used them for years and years and years, and I'd never go without them. I agree with you. Uh, the one thing I would add to it, if you're like me, you want to get them and get them with the little holster and they got <laughs> the zinger. The, 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 because like yeah. the sunglasses, I've dropped them in the water, dropped them in the boat, wh whatever. And I've lost them and just tears on my pillow because seeing a pair of Able or Orvis, $200 saltwater, beautiful. And they do all the things you said, but they're $200 and they go, Bloop. <laughs> yeah, they sing. Right I, I do have a zinger on mine. Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to play another video here and I just got to pull it up because I didn't have it ready here. Just give me a second. I'm going to go to the video file and. Bear with me, everyone. I hope everyone's enjoying this. And I know a lot of people will be watching this video later. Uh, and I think this next video you're all going to love because it is Alex. Oh, there we go. No subtlety at all. Yeah. All right. Bring him on over here. Oh, yeah. Hell yeah. Come on. Head up, head up, head up, head up, head up. There we go. Yes! <laughs> oh my God. Okay, breathe. Hi. Wow, you went for the hopper. Yeah, he got this the hopper. Too. My first grayling ever. Hi, Andy. <laughs> okay, let's get him back. Be very careful. I'm full of emotion here, <laughs> standing in northern Saskatchewan at Cree River Lodge. I lost three grayling and was able to actually finally land this last one. And oh my goodness, to hit that bucket list fish right here, so close to the lodge was incredible. Thank you for landing that and <laughs> yes! Once the fish turned on, it was absolutely non-stop action. There. Fish on. The girl has gotten hot. Woo! <laughs> we got a dancer. A little bit uh, lighter than pike. <laughs> Easier on the arm. All right, I'm going to float down. We'll get your fish. Okay. Right. Ah, it's a bigger grayling, too. Okay, we're coming over. Yep. Okay, we're going to head up here. Okay, head up. Beauty. Nice one. That's a bigger grayling. That's a big grayling. Yep, that's a good one. Oh, I love you. That's a beauty grayling. Hi. All right, we're about to get bouncy here. Okay. All right, back she goes. Bye, buddy. Love you. Look at the color on that fin. Yeah, the color. You see that the color oh in the water God. shows? Look at that. Had to talk about the grilling. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a little bit torturous to be sitting here in two foot of snow and minus 20 <laughs> degree temperatures and get to think about all the summertime stuff again. But. Hey, it's a motivation and uh, it's an important thing. So. Uh, both, I know Alex is really pumped and Jenna, when she first did it, uh, 
those who haven't done it, dry fly fishing for Arctic grayling and those eats on a four weight, five weight rod. It's just, it's so much fun. And they're such pretty fish and they jump and they go crazy. Like there's, there's such an underrated species, but it's also because they're not accessible. So not many anglers know about it. So they come there for the big pike and they go, Hey, by the way, you want to go over here with the five weight and have a little fun. And it's like insane. It, it tends to be for, for, I would say 95% of the guys that come, it tends to be a bucket list fish. People want to catch a couple and, and kind of cross it off the list. But um, the, the, the guys that enjoy it really like it a lot. And, and it's it, like you say, it's a very cool fish. Um, they eat with abandon. They don't care. Um, they'll come, they'll jump out of the water to eat a fly. I mean, they, they just, you know, it, 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 it's a lot of fun. And, and when they're on, it's, it, it's hard to, you know, I, I like them. I like the color. I like the action. I like the way they eat. I like pretty much everything about them. No downside on, on the grayling. And like I said, in my opinion, they're a bonus. Now, uh, we've been on since 8 o'clock, and it's now 9.20, and it's supposed to be a one-hour show. So uh, <laughs> for anybody who was trying to get back to the hockey game, I'm sorry, uh, or whatever else you're watching, but this has been a lot of fun and learning stuff. I've got another video I can play um, about the equipment, but I think we've kind of covered that. Uh, so to, to sum up, nine, 10 weight rods, floating line, maybe bring an intermediate. You don't need sink tips. You don't need full sinking type six uh, fly lines for the pike. Am I wrong? No, I think, I think you're right. The only thing that I would say is that if you have a choice, I would go slightly more relaxed action rather than a super fast action rod, yeah. just because everything happens close. And so if you can get that fly line out in one false cast, uh, you're fishing again. Whereas if, you know, if you have a rod that doesn't load up until you get 15 or 20 feet of line off the end of the rod, well, that's going to take you an extra false cast to fish. So something that, that loads up easy will keep you fishing more and will cover more water and you'll be more effective. Okay, very good point. And for the grailing, uh, you're recommending four or five weight rods, eight to nine foot length? Yeah, I would say you can probably still enjoy grailing on a six weight. Okay. Um, and a three is probably a little light for our kind of fishing because it's uh, we don't fish them from shore at all. So you're out in fast water and, and whatnot. So I would say a five weight is right in the sweet spot for sure. And, and a four or six would, would work quite well. Okay. Uh, we didn't really get into the walleye. And I know uh, you want to tell everyone about how my daughter caught a, a, a record uh, walleye on a fly when she was there. But uh, what would you recommend? A six weight, seven weight rod? That's probably at the light end, to be honest. I would, I would tend towards, I, I, I don't know that I'd bring a special rod for walleye. If you brought a six weight for grayling, we could use that for walleye. If you had a sinking line, to be honest, you can use your nine weight. Uh, you're catching 24 inch and up walleyes. And, and so there, there's going to be a pretty good scrap anyway. And so it's, it's whatever you have, um, unless you're a dedicated walleye fly angler, uh, you're probably going to do it a little bit and then you're going to go fish for pike or whatever else anyway. And so to be honest, I wouldn't really, I, I would bring a line for walleye. I wouldn't worry about bringing a rod. Um, bring a nine weight with a type, you know, a, a type six or something fairly fast sinking. You're fishing six, you know, say five to eight feet probably. And, and, you know, mile and a half, two and a half mile an hour current kind of thing. So fairly, fairly swiftly moving water. Um, you're going to have to either drift like uh, when we was fishing with Jenna there, we were, uh, we set up the boat and then we drifted with the current. So that allowed her to get down without having to deal with that. And that made it a lot easier for us to get on fish. But, uh, you know, it, there, there are so many spots. And to be honest, my second largest walleye that I've ever caught there was caught on fly rod. So. Which would amaze a lot of fly, uh, walleye anglers. And, and I have to tell you, I mean, my daughter, um, you know, this is what children do for you, uh, continues to crush my, my ego. Uh, I used to think I was a rock star because in Northern Ontario on a fly rod, I caught a 24, then a 27. And when I thought I couldn't beat that, I got a 30 inch walleye on a fly rod. This was uh, up in Northwestern Ontario. Yeah. And then she says, I'm with her. We're in Northern Manitoba and she gets a 30 and a half inch walleye on a fly rod. Yeah. And you've got big, big walleye. 
we have we have the wall I was talking about was 30 inches on the fly rod. And and uh I have a I have a 31 incher that we caught fishing for pike with with a spoon. But um the 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 biggest walleye that we caught on the fly rod was that 30 incher. And we were catching those guys were catching 25 or 30 in a morning kind of thing. So it was really good fishing. I mean, the guys with jigs were catching more, but but we were having a good time and, and it was really effective. Yeah. And that would be so much fun on a fly rod. The fight you would get would be if superb. You it, if you hit it exactly right, yeah. there are a couple spots where I can sight fish for a walleye. Oh, that would be so cool. And see the eat and everything? Four feet of water, crystal clear over sand with little steps in the sand and, and you can just drift nymphs down to them and they'll go, it's, <laughs> you have to hit that right. That's one of those things. But. Uh, well, uh, Chip, I think we're going to wrap her up. And uh, as we're wrapping up, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for, for uh, joining us tonight and talking about uh, pike fishing, uh, grayling fishing, a little bit about the walleye, talking about Northern Saskatchewan. Um, I think obviously you've got a lot of information in your website. Uh, talking about what to bring and especially because uh, you are in northern Canada and you've got to dress appropriately and bring the right gear because the, the weather can change wildly and even though you go well it's the end of July of course it's going to be nice well no it's still northern Canada and you get that northwesterly wind and you can have a you can have snow for goodness sake right well I've only had snow in July a couple times but <laughs> he, he words are a couple times so the point is you dress and you prepare and all that good stuff's in there. And obviously when, if they call uh, the lodge and, and want to book a trip or anything, you're going to give that to them. You've got it on the website, but I've got to put something up. So everyone gets perspective about what we're talking about here, because there's not too many places that you can catch buffaloes like that on a fly rod. Like that is superlative. And the thing is they're even bigger fish there to be caught on a fly rod, like fish of a lifetime. And my daughter, again, has pummeled my ego into the dirt because she's got a bigger pike than I've got. Well, you'll just have to come visit one of these times. Well, if only I could be so lucky. And while we were talking, our host there, Bill Spicer, chirped in and immediately said, I gotta go to Cree River. I gotta catch those grayling. And he also wants to catch a bigger pike than me, but. Bill, dream on. Dream on, buddy. You got to step over my dead body first. No, anyways. Get in line. <laughs> but listen, uh, Chip, thank you very much. And everybody, if you want more information about uh, Cree River Lodge, check out their website. Um, I'll put it up here. For, oh, thank you. Uh, for more information about uh, Cree River Lodge. Fabulous place. Um, and, you know, if you go, I'm just, I, I don't think you could have a bad experience. It's just a good, it, it, it's one of the places, as you said, where you've got a better than average chance to have good fishing, trophy fishing. A bad day there would be a, a rock star day anywhere else. Well, I'm talking about down south. Yeah, no, 100%. And I, it's, it's, it's one of those things where when you, when you do what I do, it's hard to maintain perspective. Because for me, a slow day, well, I don't even want to throw numbers out there because it gets yeah. silly. But, but uh, you know, like I said, I see big fish every day and I don't catch them every day, but I see them every day and usually more than one. And, and uh, it's, you know, you, you just kind of take it for granted. And, and it's hard sometimes to see it from an angler's perspective or from a visitor's perspective or from somebody who doesn't see it regularly. And that's one of the harder parts of the job is actually to, to uh, uh, you know, thr throttle back your own yesterday and day before and day before and, and let people have their day but the other side of it is that that that's when people lose their mind because they're, they're seeing things that they never expected that you know that are just so like i said that for me that's what makes the job is, is people and and showing them things that they never expected and they never saw and i mean you know like fishing with with jenna and alex and, and just you know alex was fun because she, like I said she had never done it before so yeah. that's that's always fun when you get somebody like that and their excitement was infectious. I mean, I was here smiling. I couldn't stop smiling watching the two of them when they had that double header and they landed those fish. And I was just like, I, I could see well how you have a great job. You have a great job, Chip. You see a lot of happy people. It's it's hard not to enjoy yourself when when 
that kind of stuff happens. And I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's funny because thinking back and, and it's easy to remember back to that, that trip in particular, because it was quite memorable. And, and uh, you know, I, 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 as much as anything, I think about all the ones that you never show. <laughs> that's right. Listen, thank you again, Chip, for joining us. And everybody that's uh, watching, whether you're watching the live event or you're watching us later, we have a lot of people who watch this, these uh, um, uh, interviews later. Thank you for joining us. And if you need any more information, go to our website or, of course, join us on Facebook and, of course, at CreeRiverLodge.com. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Have a good night. That would be .ca and have a .ca. good night. .ca. <laughs> <laughs>